Open your Bibles to Jeremiah 18. Just a quick review, go to the board. I believe this is the fourth message in this part of the discipleship series on the potter's house. We already identified, and I'm going to wrap this up in less than a minute. If you missed any of the messages prior to this, I think by the end of the week they'll be all on the website in the archives under the discipleship category, video format. The potter being God or Jesus, the clay is us. The process in this story in Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4, is to make us something desirable, useful, and valuable for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we look at some of the processes that are taken during this molding process that we are selected, really very fortunate to be chosen, to be taken out of the pit as I preached in the past. I think it was a second message, how he chose us. And one of the steps in the process of choosing the clay, the clay being us, and number two was preparing the clay. And last Sunday night, I started on sharing the clay, and I also went to Psalms 40, verse 2, and other verses throughout God's book, and looked at the word kun. In the King James, it's established, to be ordered, fixed, and so on. And tonight, I want to get back to sharing the clay for one purpose to be Christ-centered, to be Christ-centered. You hear that a lot, but tonight we're going to touch on it somewhat as we continue through Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4. We're at the point now in verse 3, Then I went down to the potter's house, behold, he wrought the work on the wheels. Now we're going to be placed, clay, us, on the wheel, on the wheel. I want you to picture this if you can. Draw it on a piece of paper if you have any knowledge of what a Old Testament Jeremiah's day. I was going to bring one here tonight and I didn't. Potter's wheel would look like what the potter would work on to produce a vessel, a piece of pottery. Now, in Jeremiah's day, it consisted of two stones. One of the stones was a lower, picture this, or draw a little picture on a piece of paper a lower, thick, round, flat stone that was, a larger, was larger and heavier than another stone I'm going to mention here in a minute. But it was a large, flat stone and heavier, and it was connected by a wooden shaft. So you have this large stone connected by a wooden shaft to a smaller stone that didn't weigh as much. It had less weight than the larger, heavier, flat stone. Now, the smaller stone was less in weight, less in size, and it also had a flat top, which the potter then, in verse 3 here, would use this flat top surface, smaller stone, to place the clay on. It would be the working surface, so to speak, on which the clay was placed. You got it? You got that picture? It's important to understand that, because you'll, you'll figure it out in a minute. Now, the potter turns. The potter, remember, is God or Jesus Christ. In this picture, in this story here we find in Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4. 
And the potter, he turns that heavier stone. I want to go slow so you can picture this. That heavier stone, which was the bottom stone, which was heavier, with his foot. You got it? And that would drive the top wheel. And it would make it go in circles. And the potter, potter being God, would control the speed of that turning stone as it would go round and round and round. The potter being God knows exactly what the right speed. Sometimes I question that. I'm sure sometimes you have questioned that also. Lord, you're going too slow or you're going too fast. But he knows the right speed for what he wants to accomplish with the work that he's doing on that particular vessel. In that case, it's us. We're the clay. Me and you. <clears throat> you got that picture? Or do I need to repeat that? I think I went slow enough where you could at least imagine in your mind if you couldn't, if you couldn't draw it on a piece of paper. Now, that's what it was like in Jeremiah's time, around that Old Testament period. Now, the potter would place upon that small stone, that top wheel, the clay that he chose and that he prepared in all the ways that I taught, it, taught about in the past messages. You got it? And he would place this on that the clay. Now stay with me. Put the spiritual understanding to this story. Word the clay. So he placed the pre chosen, prepared clay on this top wheel, and then he would go to work. Not that he hasn't already, but that's where we are now in the next segment of this particular message on the potter's house and the work he's doing on the wheel. So let's recap real quick. He's taken, us, he's taken the clay, the potter that is, out of the pit, that horrible pit, as Psalms 42 states, that noisy pit, the pit of this world. He has prepared us, and now he's placed us on the rock, and now has established us in our path, or coon us in our path. And I don't have time to review that. If you didn't listen to the last message on this subject last Sunday night, then you need to go back when it's available in the archives and listen to it. I just don't have time to re repeat any of that or refresh any of that particular message. Now, let's stop and think about this. He's taken us out of the pit, he's prepared us, and now he's placed us on this rock. And he has established, fixed, ordered, are, and all the definitions that went with Kuhn that I taught on last times, are pass. It kind of reminds you of a story back in the Gospels, or ahead in the Gospels. Matthew 16. You find in Matthew 16, you can go there quickly, we'll go back to Jeremiah here in a minute. You read the story starting in the ver verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I am? The who, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. 
some Elijah and others Jeremiah, or one of those prophets. He said unto them, Both whom say ye that I am, but not both, excuse me, but whom say ye that I am. Okay, that's what they're saying, but who do you think that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, there's a definite article there, the Son of the of the living God. <clears throat> and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. But my Father which is in heaven, I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter. And I have had you circle that word before. The Greek is Petros, or Petros. That's just a little stone, or a stone. The Catholic Church, and even some of the Protestant world, believe the church was built upon Peter. No, they, no, it wasn't. Thou art Peter, thou art a stone or a little stone, and upon this rock, Petra, this rock, Christ, is the rock of the church. I will build my iglesia. I will build my, the Christians that I call out for my desirable, useful, and valuable purposes. And I was thinking about that this evening, this evening just before I arrived here, how even the New Testament reflects on the Jeremiah story, if you think about it. We are placed on the stone, the rock in this case. We're not placed on a disciple. You're not, your faith is not based on some disciple. Your faith may be based because of what you heard a disciple preached or taught, or maybe something that I have said. But it's not based upon me. It's based upon what I've communicated about him. Because he is the rock. The whole purpose of this message is we need to be on the rock to be molded. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Upon this rock, I will build my church. I will build you. I will, he will build me. You get it? He will build you and he will build me for his desirable, useful, and valuable purposes. And the gates of hell shall not prevail, literally be superior of any strength against it. Against who? You or me. Because he's referring back to the church again. Now, that was just a sidebar. Something I thought of on the way here. Nothing's changed. Throughout God's word, the message is always the same. To be centered on Jesus Christ. Haven't I said that for years? Back to verse 3. Now, after the potter places this lump, let's just... I'll just use me for an example. This lump of clay, this glob of clay on the wheel and sets it to, sets it to spin. <laughs> he just doesn't leave me there spinning. He just doesn't leave you there spinning. He places his hands on the clay. He places his hands on you and on me, folks. He doesn't abandon us, spinning on that wheel, that rock, that stone. He places his hand. Now, at first, you might think, at the first placement of the hands of God on you, on the lump of clay, is to shape you. And this is where I disagree with so many. It is not God's first intention, once he has you in his hands on that stone, that wheel, to shape you. Because anybody that's ever done any pottering or studied it like I have, and I studied it quite a bit, you just don't take that clay and start making a whatever you're trying to make. That's not something that happens automatically. Here, once he places his hands on the clay, God speaking, because he's the potter, it's not to shape the clay. I'm sure most of you 
thought that was going to be the very next step in this process. No, it's not. The, what the potter has to do before that shaping ever takes place is to center that clay. Because if it's not going to center it, be centered, you're going to have a host of problems develop. A host of problems. So he places his hands on you, and then he goes about what he does, and that is center you. That's assuming that at that point, you're not resisting the potter's centering. And of course, I'll use myself as an example because some people listening to me probably have too much pride to say, well, that was not my problem. Oh, really? Maybe not at first, but along the journey, as he has to remold that vessel and start over and center it again, you might not have been so obedient in allowing him to place his hands and center you as much as you think. I know I have some self-righteous ones out there that just totally disagree with me, but go ahead, disagree. I'll use myself as an example. I don't even have to play the fool because it's happened to me. Not just once, not just twice, but more times than I would like. Because at first, or at times, let's just put it that way, the clay fights with the potter here in Jeremiah 18. It fights. And when it fights, when it resists, what happens? It becomes uncentered on the rock. It becomes uncentered. Each time it goes around, because of the resistance, it goes around the pot in the potter's hands, what the potter finds is resistance. Especially in today's Christian world. Well, I thought a Christian was this. I thought a Christian was that. No one said because of what I heard. After I'm saved, this is what my life's going to be. I didn't know about all this other stuff. Wait a minute. I wouldn't sign on. Lower me back down on the pit. No, I'm going to extremes to make a point. Maybe some is not so extreme or for some. We are dumb sheep. We are foolish clay, stupid clay, brainless clay at times, especially when we don't want to be centered by him. Clay, once on that wheel, it doesn't automatically center itself, does it? It doesn't automatically center itself. I don't know about modern, well, not so much about modern techniques and instruments of making pottery, but in context, in Jeremiah's time, you couldn't get a lump of clay, just plop it on the rock and say, center yourself, or don't say anything, and it just moved on its own. That's not how it happened. I know I'm being very simple here, but I'm trying to be simple to make a very strong point. Clay does not center it itself. Clay has to allow, it's a must, allow the pressure of the hand of God to firmly position it, the clay at the center point. At the center point. That's why I wrote, I'm going to put it back on, the board. That's what I wrote. To be Christ-centered means that you have to submit yourself to the potter's hands so he does the centering. 
I mean, there's no way around it, folks. There's no way around it. He wants to center us on the rock. In our day, Jeremiah didn't have this luxury, I don't think, of understanding exactly what was going to be available about 600 years later. And that was Jesus Christ coming down, the only begotten Son of God. But we, the potter wants us to be centered on the rock. And who's the rock? Jesus Christ. He's that stone, that second stone, a rock. Not really stone, but rock that I told you about you know, when I was trying to picture you what it would look like back then. It's not good enough to just be on the rock. Oh, we got a lot of people confessing they're on the rock. Oh, yeah, Jesus Christ's disciple. Oh, no doubt about it. As long as they're Jesus Christ's disciple on their terms, they'll profess that all day long. But that's not good enough. That's not a, it's not enough to be on the rock. We must be centered on the rock. That means we submit the control to him to center us. In order for what? In order to become what God sees us, what God sees the potential that's in us to be what? To be useful and to be valuable to Him, to be of service of Him. You got it? Most people are, well, all people are born eccentric. Now, you've heard that. And I just pulled it out here. I made a copy of it, eccentric. Most people understand the noun definition of it, but in the adjective definition of it is I think what's being, trying to be what's communicated here in this Potter's message. Now, most people, when you say, oh, that person's eccentric, the definition is a person who has an unusual, peculiar, or odd personality or set of beliefs or behavioral patterns. That's how most people use the word today in its noun form. But take it out of its noun form, it has a different meaning than just a personality quirk. I mean, if you just take the definition, and you can find it in any dictionary, look at it up for yourself. When you're an eccentric person, it may, basically means to be off-centered. Off-centered. You look at the dictionary definitions of it, devi deviating from a recognized center. In geometry, not having the same center, not concentric, not situated in the center. In the machinery form of the use of the word, having the axis or support away from the center. Astronomically, when it, that word is used, it's describing something that's devi deviating from a circular form or an elliptical orbit. So in other words, it's creating its own orbit. Boy, I read that, those definitions today. I said to myself, you know what? How many Christians are like that? creating their own orbit, back to what I've said, discipleship on their own terms. I don't need you to center me on the rock. I could find my way and do it myself. I'll, I know what Jesus wants for me. Oh, really? Hot shot know-it-all for Jesus. Oh, really? It basically means to be off-centered. As I read in, the, in these in these. Definitions, away from the center or an axis of the center. To have an elliptical pattern or orbit. If you really think about it, everyone is born into this world off-centered. No exceptions to the rule. Every one of us, no exceptions, are born eccentric or off-centered. And we need 
There is no doubt about it. We need to be rescued, yes. That's the first step in the process. That's what Christ came to do, to provide us salvation, to rescue us. But then we need to be centered. Because everyone is born in this world off-centered. We need to become centered on the rock, that rock being Jesus Christ. Placed in his hands and allowing him, no, not allowing, submitting to his masterful hand of what he's about to produce. Many, many people are centered on so many different things that are available to be centered on in this world today. But most people are centered on mostly themselves. They're always conniving a plan, a way, their own orbit that they could follow that's acceptable to them. And they try to suck Others enter their orbit. Some of them are crafty. Some of them are devious. We have all sinned. We have all fallen. We have all gone astray. The problem is too many Christians today understand the salvation that's provided by Jesus Christ. But they don't want the discipleship because they want to stay in their own elliptical orbit and redefine what discipleship is and then place it on that particular orbit they're on. They're the ones that are off course, friends. Christ just wants us to be centered on him. Not to be, let's just make it plain and simple, self-centered. How many self-centered, starting with yourself, starting with me, people you know, starting with yourself. When's the last time anybody walked up to you and said, we have to be Christ-centered, we have to be placed on that rock, no matter what he does with us, but we have to remain Christ-centered as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Let's search out, let's dig in. And let's not deviate from what he wants us to become, which is desirable and useful and valuable for him. No, let's, what, what can Jesus do for me today that's acceptable to me? Self-centered fools. Self-centered fools. How many times I've said, it's not all about you. Self-centered fools tend to believe that everything's always about them. No, it's not. You think because you go to church, you think because you're religious, you think you belong to this group or that group, believe in this doctrine or that doctrine, you're, you're centered on Christ? Sorry, it takes more than that. Affiliation does not cut it. That's why the church is dead for the most part. Because it's all made by man-made, self-centered doctrines that preach to itching ears knowing what they want to hear so they keep their pews filled and the money flowing in. And if you want programs, We'll provide you programs. You want projects? We'll provide you projects. We want, you want few good things to do? We'll provide few good things to do. As long as we keep you in our inner circle, in our corner church, and you don't drift somewhere else, they'll do anything you want them to do, all under the name of Jesus Christ. Not here. I think those of you who have been around a while already know that. Now back to the potter, because I'm, I'm drifting away from the potter. I'm running out of time. The potter, in these verses, cannot begin to form the vessel that he wants to produce until the clay is centered. If he tried to shape or form 
whatever he's producing, whatever vessel he's making, before the clay is centered, guess what's going to happen? And I have another definition here. What would happen? The results, an aspect of the vessel, would become too thin if the clay was not centered. Even in modern pottery making devices, the aspect of the vessel being too thin while others too thick. In other words, one side would be too thin and one side would be too thick if it was off-centered. The result of the thick side pressing upon the thin side with its weight and mass, during the drying process, the vessel would crack under the stress. Can't explain it better than that. That's what happens when we're self-centered, off-centered, and not Christ-centered. You think about it. What does it produce eventually? A crack pot. A crack pot. What's a crack pot? One who refuses to be under the control, under the masterful hands of Jesus Christ, who has determined how he wants us to turn out. Therefore, if you don't want to be controlled by him, you don't want to submit to his masterful hands, his wonderful hands, you're going to justify that you're just as usable. as any other vessel the potter's making. That's how self-delusional you are. No, you're not. I got news for you. If I decided I'm not going to want to submit to his masterful hands of producing what he wants to produce for me, I'd be a useless crackpot myself. And the same is true for you. We seem to like to justify, yeah, we still could be usable by God. And just not in the, the, maybe the way he wanted to us, but we're still usable. No, it is all or nothing. Either you're in complete control under his control, under his hands, or you're not. You can't have your cake and eat it too. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. So with all that being said, how does the potter center the clay on this wheel? <laughs> There's different sizes of clay, there's different weights of clay, consistencies, and even what the purpose for that clay in the long run, the way God wants you to turn out, or what way the potter wants the vessel to turn out. So what does the potter do? Back to another definition of what a potter does. I'm going to read it to you. First, no, that's not it. First, he speeds up the wheel and places his hands as guides at borders which are acceptable to him and best for the vessel in which he envisions in the clay. After making sure there's enough water on the clay to keep it soft and moldable without getting too sloppy to change form, the potter keeps his hands on the clay until it is centered. Isn't that amazing? The potter knows what he's doing. The potter knows how much speed, how much water, how much of everything that's needed to center you on that, on Jesus Christ. He knows it. We have it available right here in God's Word to understand it. We're not being led blindly in these last days. We have more than any generation before us. So how does the potter know then, after reading those definitions, how does the potter know when the clay is centered? How does the potter know that? Good question, isn't it? At least I think it is. There's only one answer, folks. I've already given it to you. When the clay no longer resists the hands of the potter, but submits to the potter's hands what the potter is trying to produce. When we stop fighting us being the clay, when we stop fighting the potter, the clay 
is centered. Period. Period. So many people have been called. So many have been taken out of the pit. Many have been prepared for the clay, prepared for the shaping of the clay. And they find themselves living on the wheel. And the wheel is always turning. But they're also resistant to the hands of the potter. What a sad state to be in. They think the potter's invading on their space. Or they don't like the pressures. They want to remain on their eccentric, elliptical orbit that they've created, a life that they have chosen for themselves without too much interference from God. And they keep turning around, keep spinning around, they keep coming back around the same old place on the wheel one side too thick, one side too thin. One side too thick, one side too thin. Why? Because not centered on the wheel. They're not centered on the rock. Those types can never be true disciples of Jesus Christ until they learn how to submit. And I'll get to obedience in this discipleship series. This discipleship series will at least probably take me a year to go through. And I'll probably lay down more foundation and cover more ground than most discipleship material that's ever been written out there or preached. It's not a popular subject if it's rightly divided these days, folks. It's just not. Disciples of Jesus Christ are created. Let me rephrase that. True disciples of Jesus Christ, not professing ones, but true disciples of Jesus Christ are created only after we submit and be Christ-centered. You got that tonight, folks? And after we stop resisting the hands of the potter, the hands of God. You know, like clay, we keep resisting. We can dry out on that wheel. Don't let that happen. That's a it's probably better to stay in the pit. I know that seems rough. But to resist God is a dangerous place to be, folks. To resist God is to live a life of self-centeredness. You produce a self-made crackpot. And you think that's going to be desirable? You think that's going to be useful? You think that's going to be available for Jesus Christ? No. Don't be eccentric by being self-centered, period. Just don't do it. Understand what you have to submit to and willingly do it. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. And I'm not saying you're going to jump off that wheel anytime soon. That's the furthest thing from the truth. But I am saying you have to be back on that board. You have to be the last line on that board. You have to be Christ-centered. Don't become a crap pot. Yield to the Lord Jesus Christ's masterful hands. Get center on the rock. And let God begin to form you. Let God begin to shape you and create you what only he now sees 
No one else can, not even you, not even me, what we are to become. Stay centered on the wheel by submitting to him and to his wonderful, masterful hands. He knows what he's doing. He has everything under control. He's cooned us, remember? He established us. He has a fixed order for us. He knows what's best for us. Now, I'll continue this next time and talk more about the shaping process on this journey through Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4. If you understood what I was trying to communicate to you tonight, I do want to hear from you, every single one of you. So play a song. Remember to be Christ-centered in everything that involves that centering process. Submit to him. And it's your first step to being obedient to what his will is for you. And that's taking up the cross. Denying yourself, taking up the cross, and following him in his likeness. Now play a song. I want to hear from you.